So chapter 21 is focusing on genomes and their evolution. We have sequenced a lot of genomes. Um, you've got a list of them there. We can use um, these genomes to compare between organisms um, to better understand um, their evolutionary relationships to one another. Um, genomics is this examination of whole sets of genes and their interactions. And bioinformatics is using um, computer technologies to both store and analyze all of this data. So there's been some approaches that have helped to accelerate the pace of genome sequencing. Um, the Human Genome Project um, first began in 1990. It was pretty much done by 2003. Um, it had three stages, um, genetic or linkage mapping, physical mapping, and then DNA sequencing. So a linkage map basically is um, describing the location of various genetic markers on the chromosomes. Um, these markers could be genes or specific DNA sequences that help to make them identifiable. And then we use recombination frequencies to better able to understand the order and the distances between these markers. A physical map shows us these distances, how many base pairs um, are separating the DNA fragments and then putting them together by identifying overlaps and then sequencing machines determine the nucleotide sequence um, for those chromosomes. Um, a complete haploid set of human chromosomes consists of, you know, just 3.2 billion base pairs, just a little. So there's your cytogenetic map, your linkage map, the physical mapping, and then the DNA sequencing. The whole genome shot put gun approach was developed by J. Craig Venter in 1992. Um, he said we don't need to do all this genetic and physical mapping let's just sequence a whole lot of dna fragments and throw them in the computer and help let the computer organize the fragments for us um, so the dna um, sequences on the chromosomes were just cut in random places you could have been using restriction enzymes um, and they were cloned into plasmid or phage vectors and then those were sequenced and then once they had the sequences, they saw how they overlapped and they were able to put them together. Um, we initially used the three stage process and then we moved to the whole genome shotgun approach. Um, there was definitely some skepticism about just throwing it all in one big pot and seeing what came out. Um, but things happened so much more quickly. It is now widely used and widely accepted as a sequencing method of choice. Um, and having developed newer sequencing techniques has helped to increase the speed at which genomes can be sequenced and decrease the cost that's involved. Um, we also now have metagenomics, um, and this is really key for your microscopic species, where we can take a group of species, which is known as a metagenome, um, that's collected from an environmental sample and sequence all of their genomes. Um, so we don't have to culture species anymore um, in the lab to get enough DNA to be able to sequence it. So bioinformatics is used to analyze genomes as well as their functions. So we've got all this DNA, what are we gonna do with all this DNA? Um, and so by having um, the DNA available or the sequencing available to us using computers, um, we can more rapidly analyze what's happening within that DNA. Um, there are lots of sources for these data repositories. Um, NIH um, and the National Library of Medicine created NCBI. Um, and then there are some others um, outside of the United States. GenBank, which is the NCBI database for sequence, basically doubles its data every 18 months. Um, and as y'all have seen, there is software um, that can be used to search for specific DNA sequences or protein sequences or amino acids. And we can also look at 3D views of protein structures if they have been determined. So once we have these DNA sequences, we can better examine the genes using what we call reverse genetics. Um, being able to identify protein coding genes, because not all the DNA is gonna code for proteins, is known as gene annotation. 
and that is pretty much automated by comparing these sequences of unknown genes with those of known genes in other species, we might better be able to understand what their function is. So we've talked a lot about the DNA and the genes. Now we're going to talk about proteins. Proteomics is examining systematically proteins encoded by a genome, since proteins are the ones that are going to be carrying out most of the activities that take place within your cells. Um, and so we can use systems biology to um, define um, how proteins interact and where they're found, out, found at within genes. So um, researchers use the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, and they basically took pairs of genes and disabled them one pair at a time to create what we call double mutants. And then what computer software was able to map those genes that were disabled to better understand how they interacted with one another. Um, we would not be able to do that if we didn't have all the sequence information and we didn't have the technology to be able to analyze it effectively and rapidly. <coughs> there you can kind of see some of the mutations and how they were able to see how they um, interacted with the yeast. Um, so how can we use this with medicine? Um, Cancer Genome Atlas Project is um, looking at common mutations in three types of cancer uh, by comparing gene sequences um, and how they are expressed in normal cells versus cancerous cells. Um, and it's going to be extended um, to 10 other common cancers. And we have these gene chips that are able to hold most human genes. Um, as we've talked about already, genomes do vary in size as well as gene numbers and gene density. Um, as of 2010, there have been 1,200 genomes that have been completely sequenced, primarily bacteria, but um, we have 124 eukaryotes, and there are lots more genomes and over 200 metagenomes currently um, in the process of being sequenced. Um, your genomes are going to vary in size. Bacteria and archaea range from anywhere from 1 to 6 million. Eukaryotes typically are larger. Plants and animals have genomes that are um, larger than 100 um, million base pairs. Humans have a 3,000 million base pairs. Um, there is no systematic relationship between phenotype and genome size. The number of genes is also going to vary. Free living bacteria and archaea, 1,500 to 7,500 genes. Unicellular fungi, around 5,000 genes. Multicellular eukaryotes, around 40,000 genes. Again, genes do not correlate to genome size. Um, C. elegans has 100 million um, bases and it's got 20,000 genes, while Drosophila has 165 million base pairs and it has 13,700 genes. Um, remember vertebrate genomes because of being able to splice your RNA transcripts um, into multiple peptide, polypeptides can get lots of bang for their buck out of their genes. So humans and other mammals are typically going to have um, the lower gene densities for a specific length of DNA. We also have, um, an, by us, I say the multicellular eukaryotes have a lot of introns within their genes as well as a lot of non-coding DNA. So the mo majority of the eukaryotic genomes does not code for proteins or functional RNAs. Um, it was thought initially that this was just junk DNA, but we have learned that it actually does have some pretty significant roles in your cells. Um, humans, rat, and mice show some very high sequence conservation for about 500 non-coding regions. Um, the human genome only 1.5% of it actually codes for proteins, ribosomal RNAs, or tRNAs. Um, about a fourth of the human genome is coding for introns and gene-related regulatory sequences. So what's going on with almost 70 or a little over 70% of our DNA? Intergenic DNA is this non-coding DNA found between genes. Pseudogenes are genes that have mutations and as a result are now non-functional. And repetitive DNA is present in multiple places within the genome. Um, Three-fourths of this repetitive DNA is as a result of transposable elements or sequences related to them.
So that is a good chunk of it. Again, we also have that repetitive DNA, the large segment duplications, but you notice the exons, you notice the introns, and then you notice the regulatory sequences. So only those purple ones are the ones that actually are going to have an impact on coding for proteins. What the heck is all this other stuff? Um, so transposons, uh, transposable elements, um, were first described by Barbara McClintock um, when she was doing some breeding experiments with Indian corn. She um, saw changes in corn colors that would only make sense if genetic elements had moved from other genome locations into the genes for kernel color. Um, and so they're basically elements of DNA that move from one site to another. We see these both in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, in eukaryotic um, transposable elements, we can have the transposons, which are through a DNA intermediate cut and paste, or we can have retrotransposons, which move from an RNA intermediate copy and paste. So there's your DNA of your genome. You have your transposon copied, and then you have it inserted. In a retrotransposon, you have it turned into RNA, reverse transcriptase turns it into DNA, and then you have it pasted in. Um, multiple copies of these transposable elements and related sequences are seen throughout eukaryotic genomes and primates. Um, large um, amounts of these transposable elements um, consist of similar sequences known as ALU elements. Um, the ALU elements can be transcribed into RNA molecules. Um, function at this time is not known. Um, we also contain a lot of these line 1 retrotransposons, L1s, and they have a fairly low rate of transposition. It's thought perhaps they might have some impact on gene expression. Um, some other repetitive DNA we run into, 15% of the human genome, are duplications of DNA sequences from one location to another. Simple sequence DNA are copies of tandemly repeated short sequences. When we have repeating units of two to five nucleotides, they're known as short tandem repeats, STRs. They can vary within a genome or individuals. Um, they're very common in your centromeres and your telomeres. Um, perhaps they play structural roles within the chromosome. Um, we also have genes that are present um, in one copy per haploid set of chromosomes, um, but we have some genes that are found in multi-gene families, which are collections of identical or very similar genes. Um, they have identical DNA sequences. They tend to be clustered in groups, like those that code for RNAs. Um, and we can also see these um, multi-gene families with the gene families that are related that code for globins, the alpha globin and the beta globin, which are polypeptides used in hemoglobin. Um, they're coded by genes in different human chromosomes, and we have them expressed at different times in the development. Um, you will have a different globin when you are an embryo than you will when you are for alpha than you will when you are a fetus or an adult. Um, well, with beta, you'll have a different one when you're an embryo and then you'll have ones when you're a fetus and you'll have ones when you're an adult. So duplication, rearrangement, mutation of DNA can all have an impact on genome evolution um, because that is, um, mutation is what underlies most of what happens in terms of genomes evolving. Earliest forms of life basically probably had a very um, simple amount of genes, only the ones they absolutely needed to be able to survive. Over time, as the genome size has increased, we have additional genetic material, which is able to provide a source of genetic diversity. And then there can be accidents. Meiosis, um, we can have polyploidy take place where we end up with extra sets of chromosomes. Um, sometimes genes in those extra sets can diverge as a result of accumulating mutations. Um, the variations that um, develop um, may persist if the organism that has them is able to survive and reproduce and pass them on to their offspring. Um, so we can also have chromosomal, chromosomal structure alterations. 
Humans and chimpanzees have a very similar number of chromosomes. Humans have 23, chimpanzees have 24. Um, humans and chimpanzees diverge from a common ancestor, um, and as a result, um, two ancestral chromosomes fused in the human line. Um, duplications and inversions can result um, as a part of meiosis. And so when we take um, human chromosomes and some other mammalian species, it basically can, we can use the similarities and the differences to describe what we think would have happened on a chromosomal level in their evolutionary um, development. So there's your human chromosomes, there's your chimpanzee chromosomes, and then you have the different sections of humosome chromosome 16, and you can see the comparable sections on the mouse chromosome 7, 8, 16, and 17. Um, duplication and inversion rates seem to have accelerated about 100 million years ago, um, and that kind of corresponds to when um, the dinosaurs went extinct and the mammals diversified. Um, so perhaps these rearrangements um, led to the generation of new species. Um, we also sometimes will see recombination hotspots as a result of chromosomal re rearrangement um, that are associated with disorders. Duplication divergence of gene sized regions of DNA. So during prophase one, we talked a lot about crossing over taking place. Well, sometimes unequal crossing over might occur, which would result in a deletion in one area and a duplication for another. Um, transposons can provide size, or sorry, transposable elements can provide size for crossing over between chromatids that are not sister chromatids. So you could have an incorrect pairing, you could have crossing over occur between them, and you're going to have um, substantial changes to the chromosomes as a result. So genes with related functions and how they have evolved over time. We're going to use the human globin genes again as an example. Um, the genes that encode the various globin proteins evolved from a common ancestral globin gene which is that we believe duplicated and then diverged about 450 to 500 million years ago. After the duplication events occurred, um, differences in the globin family genes arose as a result of mutations, duplications of those genes, additional random mutations gave rise to the globin genes we have now, which are used um, in hemoglobin. Um, and if we look at the amino acid sequences of the globin proteins, it provides support for this um, hypothetical model of gene duplication and mutation. Sometimes as a result of evolution, we can have genes develop that have new functions. Um, if they've diverged so much, the function that they actually coded for is no longer the same. Um, the lysozyme gene was duplicated and evolved into the gene that codes for alpha lactoalbumin, so that's proteins um, in mammals. So lysozyme is able to prevent, protect animals against bacterial infection. Alpha lactoalbumin is playing a role in milk production. So very, very different roles now. We can also have exon duplication and exon shuffling. Uh, by being able to duplicate or move exons, we can have genomes undergo um, evolution. Um, meiosis errors can result in exons being duplicated um, from one chromosome um, and then deleted from the homologous chromosome. We can also have, as a result of exon shuffling, uh, meiotic errors, which could lead to mixing and matching of exons either within genes or between non-allelic genes. So there you see the epidermal growth factor that has multiple exons, the fibronectin gene with multiple finger exons, the plasmogen gene with a Kringle exon. Those are all portions of your ancestral genes. And now we have the TPA gene where we have both exon shuffling and exon duplication occurring. So how do these transposable elements contribute to genome evolution? Um, Again, you can have these multiple copies of the transposable elements that could lead to recombination or crossing over between different chromosomes. You could have insertion that could present, um, prevent proteins from being made. 
um, you could have insertion of these within a regulatory sequence that could lead to increased or decreased production of a protein. It could result in a new gene or um, a series of genes being moved to a new position or create new places for alternative splicing. Um, a lot of times these changes are not advantageous, but every now and then you might get one that is beneficial. So by comparing genome sequences, it does give us a little bit better understanding as to um, when um, sequence, when species diverged from one another um, and how things have changed over time. Um, and so by understanding the genetic changes, we can better understand, um, understand what's happening on a morphological level and the diversity that we see physically. So looking at closely related species and comparing their genomes but helps us better understand more recent evolutionary events. Looking at distantly related species helps us better understand ancient evolutionary events. We can look at the relationships through these um, trees um, that we will get into more in chapter 26. So there's um, a phylogenetic tree showing us um, the relationship between bacteria, eukarya, and archaea domains. And then we have one below um, that's looking at the relationships um, between mice and humans and chimpanzees. Highly conserved genes are going to change very little over time, um, and they do definitely help us better understand relationships between species that diverged um, much further in the past, um, such as um, with our bacteria and archaea and eukarya. Um, and by looking at them in one organism, we can apply that to other organisms. Um, genetic differences um, between closely related species are often going to be correlated with phenotypic differences. Um, if we compare mammals with non-mammals, we can better identify which genes are going to help, um, are going to make something a mammal versus a non-mammal. Um, so with humans and chimpanzees, our genomes differ by 1.2%. Um, due to single base pairs changes and by 2.7% as a result of insertion and deletions. We do have genes that are evolving more quickly in us than in chimpanzees, um, and they would be genes that are going to have a more significant impact on our ability to survive and reproduce, such as um, genes that will help us um, better protect ourselves with malaria and tuberculosis, have an impact on our brain size, and then the genes that code for transcription factors to determine which proteins get made. Um, we differ in a FOXP2 gene um, whose product is going to have an impact on gene um, vocalization. Um, and it's thought perhaps that differences in that gene can explain why we can communicate by talking, but chimpanzees cannot. And so there is um, some examination of what happened when um, the FOXP2 gene had disruptions. We've only been around for 200,000 years, so we're pretty low within species in terms of variation. Um, our variation is typically due to single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, inversions, deletions, duplications. Um, we have a large number of copy no, um, number variants, um, which can be used to examine human evolution and human health more closely. Um, so EVO-DEVO is evolutionary developmental biology, and that's looking at developmental processes and how they've evolved in multicellular organisms. Um, we can use genetic information um, to see that very small differences in gene sequence or regulation can have a significant impact on its expression. Um, there are developmental genes that are definitely conserved on a much greater extent um, among animals. And so if we look at the homeotic genes in Drosophila, um, we see that they all contain what we call a homeobox. Um, so these are sequences that are found both in vertebrates and invertebrates. 
Um, these genes code for domains that allow proteins to bind to DNA and facilitate transcription. Um, they're called Hox genes in animals, and we've seen similar sequences in regulatory genes for yeast plants and some prokaryotes. Besides these, there are developmental genes that are also very highly conserved um, depending on your species. So when there are changes in these developmental genes, it can lead to some pretty significant impacts on um, physical um, shape of a species. Um, so some of these Hox genes are going to have an impact on leg bearing segments with crustaceans and insects. That's one example. Um, and then there are genes that are going to have different roles depending on the species that's involved. For plants and animals, um, development is um, going to be largely determined on how transcription is taking place, when genes get turned on and off, um, how finely tuned that process is occurring. Um, the developmental process is definitely different in plants and animals and DNA backs this up. The Hox genes in animals do have a regulatory equivalent in plants. They're known as Mads box. And that's just kind of overviewing a little bit of the similarities and differences among the genomes.